Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The topic for today, um, to be emotionally rearranged and displaced. Um, that's one of my favorite lines in this big book because I just remember my sponsor was so patient and loving and kind. Um, so my sobriety date is September 22nd, 2009. I had um, come to Alcoholics Anonymous with a few years dry of from alcohol suffering terribly um, from untreated alcoholism. I was about to lose my job. I was getting a divorce. I was about to lose my child. Um, my coworkers, my colleagues were afraid of me. And that to me was shocking because I never saw myself as a bully. I never saw myself as someone who suffered um, terribly towards others. I always felt that I was the victim and, and other people were always tormenting me, right? And so what a shock it was to hear that my colleagues were afraid of me. And if I really wanted to keep that job, I needed to go to the employee assistance program. And it was there that I went. And that's when the obsession to drink returned. And um, because it had been lifted through the 12 steps, it was just... Um, a different program. And I, I can't treat alcoholism anywhere else than in Alcoholics Anonymous in my experience. So I was in a fellowship. The closest thing I got to was my sponsor's husband's big book. She like looked at me, saw me coming before I saw myself, handed me her husband's big book and said, you might want to try some AA meetings. Um, and I tried one and there was only one woman in the room and she was like days sober and I was arrogant and afraid. And that makes me really combative. I, I know this to be true about myself today. Um, you know, there's so many great descriptions of untreated alcoholism and there's so many descriptions of of who we are. Right. I who thought page eight of the big book, Bill story. I who thought so well of myself and my abilities of my capacity to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. Um, you know, those that capacity to surmount obstacles, I always felt that I was such a champion because life was hard, right? I was having to get up and do battle on my own power against the world all the time. So when I'm going to work with untreated alcoholism, um, argumentative, combative, army building, um, you know, my little plans and designs were really like murder plots and assassination plans. And it was like character assassination. I would try to build armies uh, of people against people. And it was it was a really hard and exhausting way to live. But I didn't know any other way. Um you know, a little bit of background for me is that um, I was born into a family. I was not a wanted child, and that was made very clear to me. Um, the circumstances around my birth, there were a lot of um, principles. My priority, my primordial ooze of principles were like guilt and shame, anger and hate, right? And um it just made for a very hostile environment. Um, and so I viewed this world from a very hostile place. And um, so I came to Alcoholics Anonymous having been separated from alcohol for 13 years, but we call that so dryety, right? Like if I don't have a solution, it's really a very painful existence when I'm um, trying to fight uh, the the urge to drink, um, the obsession to drink. And, and what I know to be true for me today is that I cannot, I do not have that power. Once when that circular thinking of the ease and comfort of a drink takes hold, I, I'm really doomed. I, I truly am. Um, and, and I only know that to be true because of my experience and, you know, when I came to AA, I was not a very well person, and I also was not sober. Um, I, I would tell you I was, um, but I, I found myself I had developed a habit of alcohol in other forms, right? And these were legitimate, 
my doctor prescribed for me and I swear I tried to take as directed, but when it said if needed, I needed it, I needed it quick and I needed more. And so I couldn't tell you when, like when I was dosed with something, when it was the last time I took it. And my sponsor was fantastic. He, um, you know, being an Alcoholics Anonymous, when you're, um, you're suffering, wasting the time of very generous people, you know, arguing, arguing with them, being combative. Dr. Stacy said it so beautifully last week, you know, the more difficult you are, the more we love you. And that was true. And, um, so I was loved up in this program. And when my sponsor came to me and said, uh, you know, you just announced yourself as new. Are you ready? Can I take you? It's really painful for me to watch you die from this disease here in the rooms with us. Can I take you through the work? Because I have to tell you, honestly, in my experience, where I live anyway, the big book wasn't talked about. It wasn't until I found a home group that studied the big book that big book um, groups really became part of my awareness. My AA fellowship is a big fan of that 12 and 12 book, which is a fine book. It's a great book, but it, it doesn't have the directions that I needed to be led to a power greater than myself that I could trust and rely on. And that could save my life. Um, so when he extended a, a helping hand, I grabbed hold of that. We went through this work in a very thorough fashion, and um, I'm sad to say that he passed away in 2014, and I miss him greatly. But that line, you know, on page 27, where it says um, that these vital spiritual experiences, these are phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of sudden, huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. So the ideas, the emotions, and the attitudes, which were once my guiding force, I mean, that sounds very sweet. It's just a guiding force. Well, it's also like a torrent. It's, um, it's like a tidal wave that washes over me, and I'm not guided. I'm pushed, right? When I am on my own power, when I'm left to my own des- devices with my ideas, it is um, not very pleasant for myself or those around me. My emotions were all over the place. Um, and, and I used to think that I had a God in my life, like before doing the steps, if I felt an emotional connection with a conception of spirit, right? When my father passed away, it was a profound spiritual experience for me. I was very emotional. Um, you know, I felt um, a presence. I, I was in that hospital bed with him taking his last breath as he was breathing out. I was breathing breath to him as he was breathing in. Um, you know, the, the sacred act of carrying someone across the shore to the other um, to the other side of life. It, it is an emotional experience. And, and for the longest time, I thought that's what a spiritual experience should always feel like. It should always be that powerful. What I know today is that it's more subtle than that. The God of my understanding today is a divine whisper. It's something that I need to listen for. It's, it's a relationship that I need to cultivate. And these steps They are the way to get there. They're the way to be emotionally displaced and rearranged. But I was um, a bit delusional. I kept thinking, you know, that this emotional rearrangement and displacement, it wasn't going to be uncomfortable. So this is my fond spot in my, my heart as Will would kind of tap me on the head and go, oh, sweetheart, I don't know where you got this idea that it's not somehow going to be uncomfortable to set aside everything you think you know. I don't know where you thought it would be ideal or or easy to to be emotionally rearranged and displaced. I mean, that's like a huge upheaval, right? My attitude needed to change. Now, these guiding forces are suddenly cast to one side. I mean, that is like really um, being washed over by a lot of water. And a lot of holy water, a lot of tears were coming at that time, you know. Um, and a completely set of uh, new set of conceptions and motives will begin to dominate me. So I'm one of those people where if I start to feel as though I'm trapped or like um, then the next, you know, favorite line of mine is that our feet are shackled. 
on page 51, we're, we're fettered. Um, let me get the actual wording because I, I really hate it when I screw up the big book. It's such a sacred um, way of, of placing words, right? In the, in the realm of the material, my mind was fettered by superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. And fettered means chained or shackled for the feet, right? So if, if my ideas are so fixed that this is the way my experience through the steps is going to look, and this is the way I'm going to march this thing, and this is the way that I expect things to turn out, I'm not in a surrendered place. I'm not going to make very much progress because my little feet can't get very much distance between one to the other. Um, Bill's story is beautiful in that he really is telling us the depth of what we go through when we're reaching that place of des desperation. And it truly is a gift today to, to be able to say, I don't know, I need help. That is truly a gift of surrender. So no words can tell of the loneliness and the despair that I found in that bitter morass or swamp of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And until I'm convinced of that, until I can like attach those feelings of despair the loneliness until I can see that that is a result of drinking. Yes. But it's also a result of the spiritual malady. My spiritual malady is that place where I am so driven by fear. I'm, I'm unmovable. Um, I can't find willingness from that fearful place of the unknown. Like I understand misery. I understand discomfort. That is a known experience for me. And if that's the way that I perceive this world to be and the way that it always will be, then I get really comfortable being kind of like miserable. And that is really no place, place to live. I can't have a real life, right? Stumbling along to a miserable end. Um, it's very dark before the dawn, but once when the light enters, once when I start to have some experiences in this awakening of spirit, I start to see that there's a little bit of hope. And it's not the hope that I can do this right in the future, the somehow someday, but it's the hope that there's a power greater than myself that can intervene on my behalf and, and intervene between me and my problems. Um, to step in on my behalf, to be a power greater than myself, to solve all my problems, not just the problems that I think I have, but to like be able to have them fully removed. And then Bill goes on to, to describe what that kind of experience could feel like. Because once when we have taken spiritual flight, when we're spiritually liberated, it can feel like we're being catapulted or shot footed into this fourth dimension of existence. And I don't have to go away from that place. I can stay there. I can trust and rely upon a power greater than myself and, and confront and weather all sorts of really um, devastating, trying, um, scary times. You know, in the beginning, I have a sacred child. Um, he's part of the reason why I got sober in that other program. You know, I wanted to have a sober household. Um, I knew I couldn't con control or manage somebody else's drinking. Um, but I, I knew that I needed to, to really, um, work a program to the best of my abilities. And I, I, I can't say enough about the life saving measures that the Al Anon groups try to provide for us. They have a way through the steps and it was enough to provide me that um, spiritual experience, but I can't treat alcoholism using other tools than the big book in my experience, right? Um, so I have to build my sobriety on a truth and not on a lie. And I had to take a look when, when Will walked me through this at a, at a very thorough level and 
showed me in the doctor's opinion that if I am an allergic type, I can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And I needed to find out what that truth was. What was alcohol in any form at all? So like my first drink is, is um, when I was 13, but before then I was smoking pot at 10, right? So it's like, it's a head scratcher. Am I this or am I a that? Well, just take a look at your experience with all substances, you know? I was able to look through that inventory and see that there was a phenomenon of craving with some things and not with others. It is definitely there with alcohol. I was never able to control or manage the amount that I took once when I started drinking. And my first drink was a half bottle of Jack Daniels. You know, my friend Kirsten brought over the half bottle. She took a sip and said, ew, I don't like this. I took a sip and said, oh my goodness. And then I went looking for more and there was nothing left in my liquor cabinet at my house. I have a sister who's four years older than I, and she cleaned out the place, right? So I'm rummaging through drunk is all get out standing on countertops and the closest thing I find to alcohol is cream de mint and I went aha they make drinks out of this there's hardly any alcohol in cream de mint but I didn't care I downed the whole darn bottle and I had a green mustache and there was a full moon and I went running outside to her boyfriend's house tried to pick up on him threw up on him instead and had a green mustache you know the next day I felt awful and yet I couldn't wait to do it again. And and I have to say that drinking never got pretty for me. It was always that way. It was always that messy. I was always walking around in places I shouldn't be at night. Vineyards, um, hillsides, sewers, eucalyptus trees. I mean, I was in all sorts of places where, you know, classy drinkers just don't drink that way. Um, I, I just, I have to say that it, I was never that. I was always in bar fights. I was fighting with, with guys all the time. It was, um, it, it was not a way to live. And, you know, I, I have to say that even though it could have changed, um, I was trying to get sober by the time I was 20. You know, at 18, I was living a life that was um, not very uh, livable, actually. I went missing for a week. I got home. My sister said, where were you? I almost called the police. And I was like, oh, I thought I was just gone for a weekend. I, I had no concept of how much time had passed. And I have to say, you know, in those places, not good things can happen, right? And and then, you know, when I got sober, there was a part of me that was like, huh, I wonder why she was so worried about me, but she only thought about calling the police and she didn't actually do that. Perhaps that was the way I was living my life, right? It was like that was predictable. That was what you could expect from me was the unexpected. Um, you know, t such emotional and re rearrangement. The the doctors, the the theologians, many will try to emotionally rearrange and displace us when our lives are coming aside, and. It's just been my experience with all those human aids I, that I've tried. It's only been the steps that have given me that kind of relief. And, you know, um, I'm one of those people where I can't bring into my memory with sufficient force the memory, the suffering and humiliation. I can only really recall the sense of the ease and the comfort of the drink. That is something that my body, mind and spirit can call immediately. It, it it will answer all my problems if I'm not spiritually aligned. I need to have a power greater than myself that can do something better than that memory. Because if I'm in enough spiritual pain, that will turn to be the only solution. I need to prevent the spiritual pain. I need to discover um, and discard and be rid of. So, you know, I have one child um, in my sobriety, this this young man was diagnosed with some cysts in his brain. And, you know, we're very dramatic people. Even before seeing the doctor, I'm thinking terrible things and um, that that the love of my life is the whole meaning of my life really is going to be leaving me soon. And it was um, an emotionally rearranging and displacing moment. I I tossed, I turned and I railed. Um, and I also surrendered, and that was a beautiful gift. 
there was something deep down inside of me that knew that everything was going to be okay. And you know what, y'all? It's just part of his anatomy. He's got very deep valleys and very high peaks, and his cerebral fluid just doesn't flow right. So he's got some pockets of fluid. And yet, look at how I take that. I take it to this place of dire consequences. I've got to say that the power of God in my life has upheld, lifted, and carried me through some really trying times. Um, I was someone who moved to where I live in Sonoma County to go to school at Sonoma State. And um, when I was in my, my 20s, um, still trying to quit drinking on my own power, wanting to make something of myself, um, I went to school and I drank my way through that institution. And with a 1.9 GPA, they asked me to leave and said, thank you so much for attending. We really don't need you here, you know? And I have to say that it's been, sobriety has been one of the greatest gifts in my life, getting sober in 2009 and then going back to school, rebuilding my academic career, graduating from that same institution that asked me to leave in 2014. I'm now working there. So for me, that's like a whole spiritual circuit that's been closed. It's almost like a form of amends. I can I can make the institution proud of me today. Um, but I also have to say it's been trying. I've been on medical leave since August from a job that I absolutely love. I mean, my son is a student at the same institution. You cut me, I bleed Smurf blue, you know? It's like, that's my team's colors. Um, and it's been very scary not knowing First of all, a diagnosis. Second of all, a prognosis. Third of all, um, the changes that are, that are physically happening to me and, and the procedures still yet to come. And I just have to say, there's something that is very calm and centered in my life today because of, because of this program. Now, with that being said, I would like to describe what my program of recovery looks like, and that is, you know, Monday through Friday at 5.30 in the morning, my time, I'm opening up a room for people in my, my home group fellowships to do two-way prayer. And that was one of those tools that my sponsor gave me from the very beginning, using the Oxford Group's method, you know, and our 12 steps come from the Oxford Group's six steps. Um, so... There is a lot of history in that that practice. It's something that Dr. Bob and Ann used to do every morning, um, and it's a very centering practice. And I just I have such deep spiritual connections with the people that I'm so honored to pray with. Um, to to be able to learn how to listen to that divine whisper using those four absolutes of honesty, purity, and selfishness and love making it a part of my upon awakening, using the same um, journal that I've written in and and reviewing that at the end of the day. How did my day go? Where was I dishonest, selfish, self-seeking and unkind, right? And fearful. And then holding, seeing it from the the bright beacons of light that prayed with me in the morning and holding them in my consciousness and um, holding whatever whatever they're bringing to God that day into prayer and healing. And then all throughout the day, hearing of anybody who's struggling or anybody else who had a health issue, you know, saying a prayer on their behalf in the quiet of my mind, that kind of thinking is very foreign. That kind of thinking is not something that I, I naturally would have gravitated to. So there's been a change in my emotional arrangement my selfishness gets displaced just a little bit when I can go into that place. On page 166 in, six in Dr. Bob's story, he talks about how his quote is, my whole life seemed to be centered around doing what I wanted to do without regard for the rights, wishes, or privileges of anyone else. A state of mind which became more and more prominent as the years passed. That was me, y'all. That's selfishness, self-centeredness to the core. And if Dr. Bob was that, and he's, he took like 5,000 people through this work. Amazing. He was a medical professional giving away his services for free. 
sounds like he had an experience of emotional rearrangement and displacement if he's truly coming from this place where he had no regard for the rights, wishes, or privileges of anyone else. I'm impressed by that. I'm inspired by that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was in the spiritual experience. You know, it talks about how these, um, well, let me just read. So yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. It doesn't have to be Bill standing on a mountaintop with the clear wind blowing through and through. That is a beautiful experience, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be what um, William James describes as the educational variety. I can let it grow slowly. My spirit can awaken um, at a natural divine call, like as if the whisper that makes a rose bloom, right? So I can have these sudden experiences, which are truly a spiritual experience, or I can have this um, slow growth process, which is really an awakening. But let me tell you, y'all, I need to have an awakened spirit in order to have a spiritual experience. I need to be awakened to the fact that there is something better, that the way that I'm doing it is not working. There needs to be an absolute surrender in my heart, even when fearful. And that's where it gets tricky. And if you work with enough people, you'll start to be able to see that when they're combative, when they're argumentative, just like I was, I can muster up the presence of patience, tolerance, understanding, because I see myself, I see the fear that is the face of fear of the rebellious, right? And and that's another gift that Will had given me. He gifted me with this experience of um, the prayer meditation from the big book when it comes to fear. You know, dropping in and centering oneself, quieting the mind, and sitting comfortably while uncomfortable in fear is a profound experience to fearlessly face fear. Barbara, what is the fear you're experiencing? When was the first time you ever experienced that fear? Don't go looking for it. Let it wash over you. Try to put yourself back in that place and stand firm knowing that you're going to be okay. Why? Because God will have you be strong in fear. Trust and rely upon that idea, and you will move through that. And it, it has worked in times and moments of um, great distress, usually tossing and turning in the middle of the night, being able to drop into what the, the big book is asking us to do when it comes to fear, to see how it connects to the other fears to see that there's a thread that connects it all together and it's weaving the fabric. And that once when we start pulling those threads, the fabric gets rewoven by God into something else like a safety net, a safety net. I won't fall through. I don't know how to put into words that kind of experience of sitting with somebody in a sacred presence of meditation and, and being guided through the words of the big book that way. But it was profound. It, it has stuck with me. It has helped me greatly. Um, so quite often, the friends of the newcomer are aware of the differences long before it, he is himself. He finally realizes he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life and that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years, years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Sorry about that. My speakers do that on occasion. So to me, that's the essence of spiritual experience. That's beautiful. If I don't need to solve the problem, if I don't need my self-discipline, if I don't need to run the show, if I don't need to manage to control, to wrest satisfaction from this world, I am at peace 
I'm actually almost pleasant. <laughs> that was another thing that Will used to say to me, Barbara, the big question is, are you a joy to be around? You know, have, have you seen how you've been welcomed? Are you an unwelcome hanger on still? Or have you been warmly embraced by your brothers and sisters in sobriety? Um, there's so many promises in here about being alone and at perfect peace and ease and that my fears can fall from me and I can begin to feel the nearness of my creator. Those promises are in the fifth step. And that's a profound experience to be able to have that spiritual connection with a friendly hand that's outstretched to help help you cross a bridge. I love that, you know, we're left um, with some specific directions, for example, to find a sponsor on how to go about doing that. You know, um, it's their deportment that needs to shout at me. It, it's not the words. We're not going to bark instructions at folks, but we're going to love you enough to where the few hours of time spent together, there's a spiritual consent that's given. Um, and it takes a minute. And thank goodness if we go through this book as it was designed, you know, it's perfectly laid out. We can start to present some theories and then people can start to have some experiences, their experimentation. And then those theories start to be proven as fact in their lives, right? The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. We must take actions in order for it to be there. Once when we have taken those actions, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, all of a sudden we no longer have theories, but we have facts. We have great facts. We have central facts. And those facts are found on page 25, which I think is really cool that they're the counterbalance to page 52, which is where all the bedevilments live, right? So think about the bedevilments being that I'm having trouble with my personal relationships. Check. Um, you know, that I can't control my emotional nature. Check. That I'm full of fear. Check. That I cannot be useful to others. Check. That I'm, um, you know, there's, they're in there. Um, but once when I see that all of those are results of self-will failing, self-reliance failing, I can start to rely upon God. There's a theory that God can handle this, that these things under my power will fail. Then there's the experience of that truth. And then all of a sudden I'm given facts. And these facts on page 25, the great fact is just this and nothing less that I have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized my whole attitude toward life, toward my fellows, towards God's universe. That sounds like an emotional rearrangement and displacement, right? The central fact of my life today is the absolute certainty that my creator has entered into my heart and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for me, which I could never do for myself. I can't emotionally rearrange and displace myself on my self-will, but I can see some divine truths about the, the core of my being through those steps. You know, um, the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to will is um, – he had heard a speaker tape with Joe Hawk one time, and I think Joe had one line that he mentioned something about step zero, and step zero being the distance between your last drink and your next drink, right? Step zero is the place where your life is spinning out of control. You're just not aware of it yet. And for whatever reason, Will really grabbed hold of that step zero, probably because he was working with me, probably because he had to spend a whole lot of time talking me down off the ledge. And some of the things that he picked up on were from that step six, the O and objectionable, that big zero. And then also because I was expressing so much opinion, he would say step zero, Barbara, are the O's in your opinions? And the way he described this so beautifully for me was, I look like I'm a person out on a track in an arena, and I just keep running round and round and round on this track, and a whole lot of dust is kicking up, and the ground is getting woven down. And at some point, there will be a tornado of dust, 
and I'll start to see like in the physical realm, things that are flying away from me. And the, the, the more that I reach out to try and capture them as they're moving away, the further they get. He also said that it can work the same way that if your, if your trench gets worn enough, if your step zero is deep enough, it can turn into a whirlpool if you add water. You can drown in a whirlpool when, when that momentum starts moving. And, you know, we, we read um, the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox, and he does a great job outlining the state of the soul represented by water, right? If, if the soul is chaotic, then you've got a storm. If it's calm, you've got smooth waters. Um, so this whirlpool idea was really fantastic. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I see that. I'm like a drowning man in a whirlpool of my own self-will because I've run the track so deep and the tears that I'm crying are so rich that I, I'm, I'm now drowning in this self-pity. And so then he pointed out this beautiful analogy about the um, flimsy reed being the hand of God. And he would say things, profound things like, well, Barbara, why don't you just reach your hand up through the apex of that whirlpool and just grab a hold of that reed? And sooner or later, if you hold on tight enough, that storm will stop, the whirlpool will stop spinning, and God will lift you up out of those waters and bring you safely to shore. It's beautiful. Um, I love the idea of a reed. You know, that's originally what they used to make paper out of papyrus, right? It's it, the papyrus is a reed. It's a, it's a plant whose roots are deep in mud. And once when you pull it up, flatten it out, you can write on it. The spiritual tools that are giving us are writing. We're writing to see the truths down on paper. We have to capture these ideas because they move so quickly, kind of like me on that arena and the wind blows so fiercely that I have to at least try to capture one fear, put it down on paper so I can start to look at that, right? So that was the finish of the analogy that he would give, was once when I'm in this arena and I'm running the track, if I just look to my right, I promise you, Barbara, look to your right, and there will be some steps that you can take that will get you to the top of the arena. And once when you're there at the top of those steps, you can turn and look and see what that looked like. See all the things that you created down below, and then you can also see the hope that's available out beyond on the horizon. He used to speak to me in these beautiful metaphors. You know, they all came from the big book, that, that the stones that we're putting in place, these cornerstones and keystones, they're really just the rearrangement of, of a wall, I have a wall, a spiritual wall around me, and it's my job to just take a pick and a chisel and kind of separate those big stones and let the cement fall where, the, where it may and just make an archway. And from those big stones of that wall, place them down at my feet and make sure that they're secure. And then when I get to the fifth step and after I've done the fifth step and before I go into six and seven, I should take all of that granules and that sand that came from the chipping away of that wall and use that to make the cement. The tears that I cry, that holy water, that's part of the mixture too. And there's just something about this idea of that's as hard of the work that I need to do. That's as hard as I need to work is to chip away at a metaphor um, so that I can metaphorically build an archway that will lead me into the spiritual passage to freedom. And you, when I go through that archway, I get to bring the whole cast of characters that I've created within myself they're kind of like the people who stand on my shoulders and whisper to me when I'm full of fear. Each fear gets its own character. Hey, Barbara, you should do this. Hey, Barbara, you should do that. No, don't do it this way. Do it that way. Ah, they're, they're nuts. Um, you know, there's a librarian in there with a really tight bun. There's also a little vixen who dances around on a pole. There's a warrior who, like, shoots arrows at people. I've got a whole cast of characters, and I get to link arms with them, and I get to walk them through the archway in that seven-step prayer, and God gets to decide who stands on the stage next to me. And those characters, they were useful for a period of time. They kept me very safe in an unsafe world. 
and then new characters start to come in and they get a little bit more um ethereal they they become a little bit more transparent they're they're more of um, an angelic voice that will whisper wisdom and guidance instead of demands and directions, right? God is my director. Today, I listen for the stage directions from God. Um, I'm no longer trying to run the show, but I, I don't get to see what I'm doing until I start looking at that script page that I write. Where is it that I'm assigning the roles? Who am I auditioning to, to play those characters? What role am I assigning to them? Did I give them the dialogue? Am I just expecting them to understand what's going on? Don't knock over the table lamp. Don't trip on the wires. Make sure the spotlight stays on me. This is my Academy Award, right? This is the way that I approach the world, and this is what I insist upon. And until I see that that fails it, and doesn't avail me anything, it's really hard to give that up especially if I think that those little creatures standing on my, my shoulders are giving me sound advice. It's only when I see, when I have a realization that it's fear that's asking me to develop these characters and that these characters are, are driving me in my thoughts and actions that I get to see that I'm not the only one doing it. I get to see that even if people aren't aware of that's what they're doing, that the face of fear is present in almost everyone I encounter. So how, how, do I, how do I make the approach? Gently, softly, welcoming whatever the experience is between another person without having to define it or trying to negotiate it to my benefit. That's a huge emotional rearrangement and displacement. To surrender that level of control, to be that open, to allow people to just be and interact at whatever level they're going to, that that's huge. I mean, I would spend so much time trying to make sure that everyone was doing what I wanted in order for me to feel safe, secure, and comfortable in this world. So... You know, I just turned to page 70, and, and the promise that I have here is that um, I pray for the right ideal, for gui guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. When I meet people, if I'm, if I'm coming with an honest desire and my motives are to not harm others, and I'm trying to live into an ideal that I've developed with God, the principles that I want to embody, whether it be honesty, authentic authenticity, integrity, if those are the principles that I want to start to bring to all of my relationships, I can start to see how there's not a one-uppance in any of that. It's on a neutral and equal plane. And the only thing that's required from me is a sincere desire to get there with another, right? It's beautiful. I always have to look at my motives with every relationship I'm in. What is my motive with my employer? What is my motive with my child? What is my motive with my best friend? You know, I wrote an inventory um, on that relationship just to see where there was expectations. Like I am a chronically early person. She's from Guatemala, so they have a different time calculation that they do in the world. And so she's chronically late. Today, we can laugh about that, but for a long time, it used to cause me a great deal of anxiety. I would always worry, where is this person? Why aren't they here? And it wasn't until I realized that it was because I was looking for someone to be on time for me, for my comfort, did I see how selfish that was. I would have never gotten there if I hadn't looked at the nature of the relationship, why it was I was involved, where it was that I was causing bitterness and suspicion because of my need to be on time. I mean, I'm neurotic when it comes to time. I leave my house a half hour before I need to be somewhere. If I'm there 15 minutes early, I'm sitting in the car, so I'm not imposing myself upon people in an early way because I was one of those people. Like I always wanted to be at that party, and I wanted to be there before anyone else because I wanted to get whatever they had before anybody else got there to get it. Right. I mean, that was just my approach in the world. It was the way that I thought about things. It was the way that I moved. 
Um, and I don't know where that little clock thing went. Um, I seem to have lost the timer. Um, but I'm looking at my clock, and it says that it's 12.55. Um, yes, have, I have five more minutes. Okay, yeah, you I have found about the clock. Five minutes left. Great. Um, so I guess to sum up, um, thank you for this opportunity. It has been such a pleasure to be here today to talk about one of my favorite lines in the big book and to, and to have my memory of my my secret my sacred savior. You know my my very kind, patient, and diligent sponsor come into my, to my mind. So I'm going to end with this from the big book. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. This is page 100. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When I look back, I realize that things which came to me when I put myself in God's hands were better than anything I could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power, and I will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what my present circumstance. God bless you and keep you until then. Um, you know, uh, the, the page 164, um, this book is suggestive only. I suggest you do it if you want to live happy, joyous, and free. Um, God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in my morning meditation what I can do each day for the person who is still sick. The answers will come if my own house is in order, but I obviously cannot transmit something I haven't got. See to it that my relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for me and countless others. This is the great fact for me, the great fact, the central fact. I abandon myself to God as I understand God. I admit my faults and to him and to my fellows. I clear away the wreckage of my past. I give freely of what I find and I join. I join into a fellowship and we shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us if you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. My name is Barbara and I am an alcoholic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.